Hi, everyone. Welcome. My name is Shannon Jackson, and on behalf of Berkeley Arts Plus Design, it's a thrill to welcome you to tonight's lecture, Black Futures on Race in Art, Curation, and Digital Engagement. It's the sixth in our series on public reassembly, where we have been gathering artists, activists, and thinkers from all different fields to help us think about reassembly at a time when society definitely needs some new imaginative material. We're going to have some more of that material tonight. We often begin our events, as many of you know, with a thanks and a shout out to the many different organizations, campus and community collaborators who help make these events possible and work with us. That thank you convention is a convention uh, and, sounds co and sometimes gets boring in its conventionality, but it's, I think it's important to remember that when we do that, we're also marking all of the different community members, campus members, and students who cared about this event and who cared in particular tonight about bringing someone like Kimberly Drew out here to be with us. So I'm going to thank those people as a record and documentation of the energy and excitement that of people like Stephen Best uh, and Black Room, of Julia Bryan Wilson and the Arts Research Center, of students like Derek Duran, head of A-plus-D Student Committee, or of Izzy Parla Parlamas, head of the BAM PFA Student Committee. Same goes for our regional partners, many of them here, including Kara Smith from Art Practical and Weston Taruda, or Patricia, um, Patricia Carino Valdez of Emerging Arts Professionals. Indeed, tonight is a reminder of the tremendous work of organizations like Emerging Arts Professionals, and it's also a night that we might also mark the tremendous loss we all feel uh, at the passing of one of EAP's co-founders, Ebony McKinney, who I wish was with us tonight. So, thanks to those people for being who they are and for caring about events like tonight. Thank yourselves. It's people like them who are fed and feed a practice as prolific as Kimberly Drew's, and that's a practice that's hard to represent in one introduction. Her standard bio tells us that she is a writer, curator, and activist with a passion for innovation in art, fashion, and cultural studies, that she received a BA from Smith College in art history and African American studies with a concentration in museum studies at a time, incidentally, when our current chancellor, Carol Christ, was then president at Smith. It says, too, that she started after starting her blog, Black Contemporary Art. She's also worked for Hyperallergic, the Studio Museum in Harlem, for uh, Les Mans Maupin, that she's delivered lectures and participated in panel discussions at the New Museum, Art Basel, Moogfest, the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, Brooklyn Museum. Her writing has appeared in Glamour, W, Teen Vogue, Lenny Letter, she has also, since 2015, has been part of the social media team of the prestigious Metropolitan Museum of Art. And just this year, she was elected by our own Bay Area Yerba Buena Center for the Art, added to their, 100, her, their list of 100 people, organizations, and movements that are shaping the future of culture. And yet, and yet, even that list of merits and experiences did not begin to mine the depths of her impact on contemporary art and on uh, the discussion of race in our wider public dialogue. Across her writings, lectures, discussions, both online and offline, Drew is a committed curator, and if I may, teacher, pedagogue, facilitating access to and visibility for the work of black artists, opening up new worlds for her tens of thousands of followers. I'm really always adamant about taking the research of black artists very seriously, Drew explained in one interview, commenting, communicating to people that this is an entire discourse. There are so many different mediums in which people work. There are so many different histories to consider. That's why I built my blog the way I did, to show a plethora of ideas that are being explored from a black perspective. That's what will keep the discourse successful for generations to come, an awareness of being part of a community. Indeed, Drew is able to assemble in her personal and professional practice a multitude of discursive positions, mediums, histories, and positions, and publics, 
and she's assembled more of them tonight. She and my brilliant colleague, Stephen Best from the Department of English and Black Room, um, a co-founder Black, of, of Black Room, will speak more on these topics over the next hour. And I'm grateful that we have Sean Miriam, uh, Merriman Roberts, as well as Anna Mendez to interpret for them. In advance of their dialogue, though, I'm going to close with one more quote from Kimberly, this one from Teen Vogue, a media source that incidentally, as a mom of a teen, a teen girl, I'll say, has offered its own anti-oppression space uh, since under the current US administration. She said, whenever I speak, Kimberly says, I think about the saying, don't speak unless you're improving upon silence. Every time I make noise, I want it to be really good. Unquote. It's a quote that seemed relevant on a campus preoccupied with different kinds of speech. And I have no doubt that tonight will be the good, good kind. <laughs> I have no doubt that tonight's talk will be filled with brilliantly good and nuanced speech, that is, with brilliantly good and compelling noise. Help me welcome Kimberly Drew. Hello, there we go. Yeah, there's a switch. Is mine on? Okay, great. Hello, Kimberly. Hi. Welcome. Really happy to have you here. Um, so thanks for joining us. Um, thank you, Shannon, for that wonderful introduction. Uh, you saved me a lot of work. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to go through all, of, all the thanks I was going to uh, give. Um, for my colleagues and friends who are here tonight um, who helped make this event happen. Um, so all the hats that you wear, Kimberly, at the Met, um, black contemporary art, curating a black contemporary art, the inst your Instagram, co-founding the Black Art Incubator, we'll talk about all of that. Um, you know, I have a colleague, I don't think she's in the audience, but. Um, uh, every few years at our like moments of greatest like fatigue or frustration with the university, she often asks me like, "If you could do it all again, would you become a professor?" Um, and I always answer yes because even in the most frustrating moments, I really enjoy my job. I don't even think of it as a job. But now I think I would say no because I want to come back as Kimberly Drew. <laughs> I was like, I was, I was thinking, wait, she gets to hang out with Solange in Palm Springs. <laughs> okay, I don't get that job perk. <laughs> um, so you, like, I was trying, I was thinking of ways of, like, kind of qualifying this, but I don't want to qualify it. I, when I typed it out, I was like, don't qualify it. You embody the dictum, be the change you want to see. Um, so I wanted you to talk a bit about how you kind of wed black art and digital communications to just sort of demystify the whole process of how you became you as a professional. Um, so I thought we would start there. Yeah, that's a lovely way to start. Um, it's interesting. So when I started using social media, it was really uh, an act for myself. Um, it was really like any millennial, I think we find our spaces online as a way to find community around the things that we believe in. Um, so I'd been on Tumblr long before I started the Black Contemporary Art blog. I'd been totally inundating myself with these images. Um, when I was an undergraduate at Smith College, I began to study how art institutions were using social media to communicate with their audiences. Um, so I'd always found that as like a, a point of passion for myself. Um, but when it comes down to being able to illustrate what I have going on, a lot of it is just to be able to keep track. Um, a lot of it is to be able to, um, I love, or this is like one of the slides that I wanted to show and talk about, but specifically to, especially in these times, um, be an exhibit of a, a black life lived. Um, that is something that I've really taken on as a politic of the things that I'm doing, especially within the arts, um, because people don't think that I exist. Um, people don't know that I am coming into, I'm inheriting so much hard work of, of women before me, especially women, like especially black women. I mean, like, there's so many incredible black women in the art world. Um, and so being being a person who looks to them as mentors, um, being informed by the ways in which they're moving, um, makes me a better professional. And so I'm tr I, I hope that I can communicate that maturation as well. Um, 
and it, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if that answers the question, but for me, I, I think about social media as an opportunity to provide a record, um, and so I want to be able to inscribe in history what's going on, um, and especially what's going on amongst my peers as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, no, that that's clearly communicated, right? When um, um, on on the um, Instagram, on your Instagram, and and on the on the Tumblr, um, Black Contemporary Art. Um, so like my own. Part of the reason I said I wanted to kind of come back as Kimberly Drew is because my own trajectory is that like I was an art history major at Williams and part of the Williams Mafia. Totally <laughs> part of the Williams Mafia, um, um, completely like passionate about it. But when I thought about having a career, I felt like the options were really narrow. Um, and part of it, the narrowness was, th I felt like the imperative was always to think about or to conjugate art in the past tense. And so I'd never felt like there was a place I could go to really experience like what Susan Sontag calls the sensuous, imme sensuous immediacy of the artwork. I felt like I was always having to write about it historically and I didn't want to spend my life doing that. And I felt like I had a little bit more freedom going to a literature department to sort of do what I w wanted to do. So, but I wanted to think about like art history then and art history now, like what your, uh, t I want, like your experience at Smith um, and like, the, the museum studies program at Smith, like how did that shape you or or how did you sort of take advantage of yeah. being at that, in, at that institution at that time? Yeah, for sure. Um, so at Smith College, uh, there's a museum, which is dope. And anybody who goes to school here and has the museum access, it's amazing. Take great advantage of it. Figure out what you hate about museums and figure out how you're gonna solve those issues, right? Yeah. Um, so when I was, studying in school, I studied how digital ins how institutions were using digital communications to reach their audiences. Uh, I was doing it in 2012, 2011, where there wasn't a lot of scholarship around that work, um, but I tried to make it scholarly. I don't think I was successful in that, um, which is also a lesson in like, you can fail and it's fine. Like, it's fine, um, <laughs> it'll be okay. <laughs> I didn't get all A's. Um, I, I was joking to people before this, I was like, I love doing talks at schools I wouldn't have gotten into. <laughs> but at any rate, um, that approach of, of being able to do something, uh, to, to, do, to do the case studies that I was doing, um, because there wasn't the scholarship, I had to go one-to-one -to, -one to these channels and, and look at what people were doing and try to identify strategies. Um, I was also way too afraid to send emails to people, so I was really just like an observer and recorder of the ways in which people were moving online. Um, and I think that that's a lot of how people get good at it anyway. Like Maritza, who's here, who's like the best social media manager of all time. Um, so LACMA Snapchat, that was her um, when it was great. Uh, but at any rate, um, that's not shade. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but um, so at any rate, I've, I've always been a person who is really a, an observer, right? Um, and then once I came to be in New York and realized that the work that I was doing was important, I had a great mentor who was like, who sat me down and was like, you're doing important stuff. And it, it took someone like look me in, looking me in my eyes and saying, this is important because the follower count was like whatever. Um, but someone saying, these, these folks are using what you're doing on syllabi, these folks are using what you're doing within these particular systems. Um, that was when I, I realized that uh, I needed to be more of an instigator. And so that's where I started to do more artist conversations. That's where I started to ask the real end time questions um, and have really humble conversations with people who were making things. Uh, one of my frustrations about museums, specifically the role of the curator, which is why I'm always like in this battle around whether I want to identify as such, is that a lot of times curators are afraid to have a conversation with the artist that's actually a dialogue um, and that doesn't have like an immediate endpoint or result. Um, so being able to go into a studio and actually have a conversation and a plate of pasta with someone without the expectation that it's going to result in something is something that I really cherish a lot um, and how I've modeled that work. And I think that a lot of that comes from um, from being an institution and being a, being a student, uh, an observer, and understanding like there's just so much to learn and there's not, um, there doesn't have to be a roadmap or rules to how you engage in these things. Wow, that's great. Um, uh, so Black Contemporary Art, um, you were on Tumblr, but then uh, you started curating Black Contemporary Art um, in college, but you're not the only curator now who who are the other curators and how does like how did that become like a team
environment of curators? Yeah, that's a great question. I So I started Black Contemporary Art after I was an intern at the Studio Museum in Harlem. Oh, could you name your mentor, please? Oh, the mentor that I had when I was younger um, is Todd Florio. Oh, I thought you were talking about your mentor at the Studio Museum. No, 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 but Thelma Golden is a queen. Yeah, Like, right. obviously. Yeah. Like, obviously. Like, name Duh. <laughs> Um, like, hello, she's a smithy too. So I was yeah, like, yeah. yes, I love her. I want to be just like her. Um, <laughs> but at any rate, I, so I was an intern in Thelma's department at the museum and was real hyphy about it. And she still makes fun of me about it. Um, but at any rate, I was there and it was right when I just started to fashion myself as an art historian. And so I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything. Um, and I got there and the f one of the first days that I was there, I learned about Basquiat and it like changed everything. Like that was the first black artist. I was like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> like I never heard this name before. And this person has had this incredible impact. I was like, I felt like I'd been bamboozled and hoodwinked, you know? And it became Studying this art history. Right. And then it became this, right. It became this summer of like, okay, now I have like, then I learned about Trent Dilla Hancock. And then I was like, oh, and then there's the other people who are like from these other regions. And it's not just about the New York art scene. And so there was this incredible, like, mind-blowing experience that I had in this short five weeks that was there. I met Glenn Ligon. I legit met Glenn Ligon and almost passed out. Like I had to send a letter apologizing to everyone in my group because I had to excuse myself from the field trip yeah. because I was so overwhelmed by his excellence. Yeah. Um, I still feel that way. Yeah. Um, he emails me sometimes. Um, but at any rate, uh, I forget what I was talking about. Oh, I started Black Contemporary Art. Oh yes, so I, I learned all these names. I learned all these people. I got back to Smith and was like, okay, I'm gonna start forgetting this stuff, or and I also think that there's so many people who may not have access to this information. Um, and because I wanted to continue to learn, I started to seek out other blogs. Do you mind if I show your slide? Which one? The Studio Museum. The oh yeah 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So we can okay. we can do that too. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I was looking for other blogs, couldn't find another blog, and then decided to start my own. But to your to the point of your question, it was never me alone. Oh okay. It was my okay. idea, but it was never me alone. Um, which is also like I'm realizing is a thing that I keep doing. Um, I love working with other people and I like always thought I was really solo dolo. But at any rate, this post yeah. here is f like a few weeks before the blog actually started. Um, and I, I reached out to my friend Marcellus um, because he had, he, <laughs> he's brilliant. He, we were interns at the studio museum together. The first week with the, that we were there, we like walked around the room and like talked about what our goals were. And he was like, to get hired here. <laughs> <laughs> and we're all like, he's crazy. And then he did. And I was just hey. like, oh, I like that. I like that. Like, aff like affirming it was like very like stepping into your power thing anyway. So he was my ideal partner for this blog thing. Um, but at any rate, so he was one of the people that I originally reached out to. He told me no. Um, but I, nevertheless, she persisted. Yeah. Um, and then I had another friend who was at Smith with me who helped out. And then this other woman named Coco, who was actually at, uh, working at the Studio Museum. And, and Coco, I credit for so much of why the blog really popped off, because she was so much smarter than me mm -hmm. um, when we started it. Like, I was always really good at communicating, but she had a curator's mind and, a, and had this incredible ability to research that, like, I'm now coming into as I mature. But she had figured out a lot of those things and figured out a lot of um, way, ways and, or in places to look for information that I hadn't quite gotten to. Because, like, of course, like, whatever academia, but, like, you learn how to become a better resor researcher. And she had figured out some of those things I hadn't quite gotten to yet. Um, Christina, um, formerly is her name. But at any rate, so in, in these present days, there's a few people, but it's not as active anymore, which you'll notice. Like, you grow up and you don't have as much time to work on something. Um, but, but, it, but, but it's always been a group jobs. effort. Right, right. I mean, like, because when I was, when I first started the blog, I was in college, and then I would have summer vacations, and I would just spend, like, hours, hours working on it, and I don't have that much time, much time anymore. Much time anymore, yeah. yeah. Um, would you like to talk about Carter G. Woodson? No, we can skip that. We can skip that? Yeah. Okay, okay. Um, so I have this Carter G. Woodson slide that I put in all my presentations, and it's, like, almost a superstitious thing at this point, um, but we don't have to do it. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, uh, so, uh, another little anecdote. I was, um, uh, I was in Paris with my mom. We were at the Louvre. Paris with your mom at the Louvre. Let's go see the Mona Lisa. It was my one opportunity. So, we go to the Mona Lisa, uh, we walk into the gallery, and like everyone's back is turned to the work of art because they're all taking selfies. And um, so I went to take a picture of all the people taking selfies of themselves in front of the Mona Lisa. And um, I was the one who got chastised by the security guard. Now, you know, and I was- You were surveilling people? I guess, I, I don't know. 
I'm, I, I mean, Consent. care to jump in here? Like, what, how should I feel? <laughs> so so I, I asked, I said, I mentioned that because I sort of thought of that as I was trying to formulate the question. I was like, oh yeah, you know, um, you no doubt have thoughts about how social media affects people's relationship to the art on the walls. Like, what's the conversation that's going on at the Met around, the camera is in the gallery now. Like, what's the conversation that's going on at the Met about how, can you manage that? Do you have a role? Do, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, if my, my immediate thought whenever those kinds of co questions come up is to challenge yourself not to judge how other people interact with art. Totally. Because I think that that's the first mistake that we always make, where we're like, they're not doing it right. And it's like, there is no right or wrong way to interact with something, right? Um, even though I do call like the Mona Lisa thing the Beyonce effect, because like she had her moment, you know? Um, <laughs> but... I don't, I don't know, it's, it's a weird thing, because for me, like, I, I don't, it's rare that I see a show that I don't take a picture of and share on social media, unless I really don't like it. Right. Uh, like, I really, really don't like it. Um, but I, I don't know, I, I think it's a weird thing, or even thinking about, like, the Instagrammable museum or those types of con uh, concepts. Um, I think if, if you're using social media as a tool for something else, that's an important gesture. If you're using it as a tool to share with your audience this experience, or if you're using it as a tool to inspire others to come to see something, like, what's the harm in that? Um, but if you're being a tool, <laughs> and someone's trying to see a work of art move out of the way, like, obviously. Right, right, right. Um, but I don't think that there's a way in which we can give more value to one way of seeing than another. And I think that that's a problem historically within museums. Right, right. It's, it's, it's why people don't enjoy museums, because they feel like they are only allowed to experience it in a kind of narrow band. Right, or like yeah. there's a particular choreography or even thinking about how, um, like that's what that's why I like to say like what I like and don't like and I don't always point to things, but that that's a thing that you can do um, and you don't have to be an art critic and you don't have to be an art historian and you don't have to be a super genius to see something and know you don't like it. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that that, that, uh, that self-possession and being able to make those decisions around art is really something that a lot of people don't feel like they have access At, to. Right, or power. Or power mm -hmm. to, or the agency to decide um, but if, if your agency says, like, I want to take a picture of this thing because I love it, like, who are, who are you to judge this person, like, mediating this experience through technology? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, w at the Met, um, like, what, so, I, s s I have a friend who was visiting from New York, and, um, I said, oh, you know, I'm excited, I'm interviewing Kimberly Drew next week, she does social media at the Met, and he's like, he lives in New York. What does it mean to do social media at the Met? And I and when he asked that question, I mean, this is a pretty smart guy. I was like, oh, that would be a good question to ask Kim. Like, <laughs> like I'm stealing that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm totally stealing that. That's a question, right? <laughs> uh, m m the grand, like, sixty percent of my job is email, which is like oh. the least sexy thing. Uh, huh. But it's a lot of back and forth. It's a lot of asking permission. It's a lot of checking in. It's a lot of preemptively understanding that people aren't going to ask for something until the very last minute. Um, but what does it mean to do social media for the Met? It's, I mean, f f thank goodness for Facebook Live. Like, that's my favorite thing. Um, Facebook oh, Live. So. Like what? Facebook Live provides the opportunity to show people what's going on in the museum in real time. Uh, because I think that a lot of times, like you were saying, as an, ac as a, as an academic, it's often retrospective. Yeah. But Facebook Live is like real, in the moment, I can grab this librarian and this librarian can talk to me about the acquisitions in the library and people don't even know we have libraries. Right. Um, so being able to provide that immediate, one-to-one, -one, intimate relationship with the museum, that's what my job is. Oh, wow. um, or that's what I take on as my job, which means a lot of email and a lot of permissions and a lot of like- So when you say permissions, you mean- Massaging of egos. Okay, <laughs> getting getting other members of the Met to participate be on, yeah, be in on your board. IC, be on board. Okay, yeah. are there any projects that are happening right now that particularly excite you? That you're. Ooh, um, I'd have to think about that. Okay. I mean, it's funny because last year was so exciting, like Why? with the Breuer and Carrie James Marshall right. show, and right. like it was like really like badass to be like, I work at the Met. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and, and right now we're in this this period of like incredible reorganization, which isn't like a sexy thing to talk about on on stage, but like there's a lot of ways in which apartment departments are being reimagined. That is really exciting, but not really exciting to all of you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, um, so so Tumblr, Black Contemporary Art, um, Instagram, Museum, Mammy, social media for the Met. Like, for, are there 
boundaries between these things, hours you work at them, ways that you kind of, I don't know, I don't know, keep, keep it all in control or in order? My therapist asked me that on Wednesday. <laughs> My therapist was like, when are you finding the time to do all this writing? And I was like, you know, that's a great question. Um, yeah, no, boundaries are not a thing I'm good at. Um, but I don't know. It, it's one of those weird things where you're like, I don't think that there, I mean, there's a, incredible conversations around social media and labor, right, that I want to point to. Um, I, I, would, I, could, I would be a fool to say, like, when you love what you do, it doesn't feel like work, because it's hard work. Yeah. Um, but I do feel fulfilled by the work. I feel fulfilled, like, after this, when I get to talk to some of you, it's like, this is the juice that I need to, like, keep going and keep yeah. doing this thing. Um, so it's difficult, but I'm also young, and, I, and I'm able-bodied, and I appreciate the opportunity to, with the body that I have, do the work that I do. Right. Um, but there's sometimes when it's really hard. I mean, especially even this year, like, I read the internet all day. I read yeah. the internet all day all day. I cannot log out. Yeah. I cannot hide from, you know, the evils of the internet. Um, fake news very directly affects the ways in which I use social media for work. Uh, you used to be able to like upload a link post uh, and change some of the information to better like direct people or in, in, like encourage people to, to click on a link, which is of course a strategy of fake news. But now we can't use that anymore. So like there's these different ways in which like social media changes um, and makes our jobs as social media managers and like on the side of good, more difficult. Right. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a strange thing. But I went to Cuba this year for the first time. Yeah, I saw that. Now I'm just on a tangent. But I went to Cuba and like for three days didn't have internet. Yeah. Like three days of my entire life I didn't have internet, like my like conscious adult life. I was like, oh, <laughs> this is what people mean when they say unplug. Yeah. Um, so my philosophy around like being plugged in has definitely changed this year, which, which I think is for the better. Okay, great. Um, so can we look at your Instagram? Yeah. Okay. The slide of my Instagram? <laughs> Hold on. Oh, wait. No, this is black. Wait, let's start no, this is just like my slide when this, I'm like, this is what I do. This is what you do, yeah. Because Stephen was like, we need to talk to people about what you do. But then like there was this beautiful set of introductions. So you yeah, yeah. just kind of get it. Yeah. Um, so these are... Okay. Oh, this was one that I chose. So the thing I loved about your Instagram is... Um, uh, it's incredibly polished, but also spontaneous. And I kind of, I felt like it was offering me these beautiful wormholes where I could like find things. Like I didn't know about anti-capitalist love notes. Um, uh, uh, but, um, oh, I, I know what I wanted to ask you about. Um, well, first of all, I, I mean, it's kind of the elephant in the room, like the name. Museum Mammy, it's it's on PC, yes. Like, uh, is there a history to it? Were there other versions of it before? Yeah. Okay. There's there's definitely. So I had a moment where I was like, I'm gonna change it. So this is a very West Coast audience, obviously. But there's this word in Philadelphia, John. That's like a multi-purpose word. And so for the longest, I was gonna be Museum John, but then I was like, no one's gonna get that. Um, <laughs> But so I actually, so the name came, f well, the, the first version of the name was Maud Mammy. Um, Maud being from Gwendolyn Brooks's Maud Martha, which is a text that has, has it was, was so important to me for a number of reasons. One, I encountered the book when I was broke as hell, so I actually stole the book. Um, <laughs> and then I read it and was like, oh my God, this is the most important thing ever. I'm so glad I have it and didn't just like get it from the library, right? So like that really bad act, don't steal. But it, it was like a moment of desperation. Um, but anyway, I read the book and it, and it, for me, was so important to think about what uh, black female interior is, uh, especially like when it comes to, so the book, there's not dialogue. There's no point in which uh, the main character speaks out loud, but you have incredible insight into her subconscious. Yeah. And I thought that that was so incredible um, and so deeply powerful. And, and I was studying it in, in class and it just, it stuck with me as like my favorite book and my favorite text and the version of the book that I have, the graphic identity on the cover is so ugly. It's so atrociously ugly in comparison to this incredibly beautiful book. Um, so it's like everything about this is all about like, I don't know, the, the interior, whatever. So I always kind of drifted to that. And then I've always loved the Mammy figure. Um, I just like the way it sounds, which is not a really intellectual answer. Um, but then also thinking about the self-possession of the mammy figure and thinking about how it's so easy to misread what a mammy does and, and what 
um, the ways in which we've conceptualized her over time, or even thinking about where the mammy figure appears in the work of someone like Betty Saar versus the work of someone like Kara Walker. Um, so I've always been kind of interested in the multiplicity of that figure. And then I, uh, when I was in the process of uh, studying to do my museum's concentration when I was at Smith College, one of the, uh, one of the uh, accounts that I was studying doing my case studies was this account called Museum Nerd. And it's this like incredible account that has these huge amount of followers and it's this person who would literally do kind of like what I was doing when I first started on Twitter, but go to see exhibitions and, and talk about them extensively. And so Mod Mammy became Museum Mammy. I see, I see. So um, I, I wanna get back to And this, this slide is really important because like the two most important women in my life right now are Cardi B and Raina Gossett. <laughs> <laughs> wow, okay, thanks Becky. Where's Becky? That was, that was Becky's choice. Um, I actually was after the, the Audre Lorde questionnaire. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but I'm glad that those are the two most important women in your life right now. Um, so I want to talk about uh, the, the thumbnail, um, but I want to, the mammy, the, the explanation that you just gave, put me in mind of like the mammy figure. So, um, a few years ago, um, the poet Vanessa Place got into trouble for producing a poem, a Twitter poem, that was to sort of re like reenact Gone with the Wind, and 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 the Hattie McDaniel figure was sort of a prominent figure in that Twitter. It was kind of a work of, ex you know, her. It was designed to kind of pose questions of copyright and ownership of cultural fictions, etc. But there's a there's something I wanted to ask you about um, about black contemporary art and about what is this question? It's a like it's like it's about curation, but it's also about the layers, right? Like there, I, it, this is a question about um, cultural dissemination versus cultural appropriation. Um, so Twitter's I'm sorry, Tumblr's basic architecture is appropriative. Um, and one of the things, I don't know who posted this, but you know, one of the issues in the art world of the past year what, um, ha, was the, um, uh, um, the painting Open Casket. And um, Black Contemporary Art, you posted the letter um, um, calling for the removal of that painting from the Whitney Biennial. And the, the strange thing about the letter is that it, it sort of assumes that the open casket, as Mamie Till imagined it, was really just intended for black viewers, like for black viewers to see the body of Emmett Till and not for whites to sort of see what white supremacy also does to black bodies. It, um, it's in my reading, not a terribly sophisticated letter, but black contemporary art is a very sophisticated and nuanced site. And I start, I, I was sort of thinking, it, it, as curators, like what kinds of, conver do, well, I don't know. I don't know if it's a matter of conversation or if it's a matter of like, um, uh, do you, do you, is there, do you have a, hmm. yeah, I'm trying to figure out like how to, it feels like there's a tension between the posting of that letter, which I don't think, um, I don't know, I, I want to talk about that painting. I want to, I totally want to talk about that painting. I was like, Stephen, what are you trying to say? I'm sorry. What do you want to I ask really me? Want to just talk ask about, it. You have I a mic talk and about the stage. You can know, ask me whatever you want. I, I kind of have to answer I it. I want to talk about that painting. Don't lose your agency in this I, moment. I totally <laughs> want to talk about that painting because it's so, it's so, so my feeling is in the same, the same way that I feel about Vanessa Place's Twitter poem, it's a bad poem. It's a bad poem. So we should put our efforts into showing how it's a bad poem. I kind of feel the same way about open casket. It's not a good painting. And, and, uh, but that wasn't said. But that wasn't said. 
like the argument for removing the painting was about cultural appropriation. Who owns Till's body or the image of Till's body? And I kind of think as curators, we are in a position to say what's a good painting and what's not. Just as you say, when you go to a gallery, if you don't like something, you don't take a picture of it. So I guess I'm kind of wanting to figure out if there was a conversation about whether or not to post that letter. No, well, there's not oh, a conversation okay. about anything. There's n that's, that's an important thing. That's what I know. wanted to hear. Yeah, okay. so we all we all act separately and post the things we want. It's really fun. It's also a little scary, right? Um, right. So I posted the letter. Okay. Um, because I, when I saw, I went to. It's kind of funny. So I have this like. It's not funny. It is my life. I go to I go to openings. Yeah. I see things before people see them. Yeah. Um, I saw the Kara Walker Sugar Baby at the gala that it was presented. I saw the Sugar Baby before people were taking obscene images. Yeah. I would have never thought in a million years that like how it rolled out because I got to see it with like this particular public. Right. Um, I similarly saw the Whitney Biennial with a particular public. Right. Um, so I didn't. I couldn't have anticipated that it would. You know, all these things would happen. But when I got word of the painting and, and also like began to think about the biennial as, as a thing, I was like, I hope someone writes a letter. And so for Hannah to be the person to write the letter, I was like, I want to amplify this thing. Um, I didn't realize it, the, like, inc like the universe that would come about around it. Yeah. Um, but at any rate, I think for me, that was the thing. So that was the, ba the, the backstory is that I appreciated, I mean, I thought it was a fine letter. I, there's a lot to unpack about it, not on stage, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I do think that, for me, I wanted, I, I now see it, so I'm working on a book project, which we'll talk about later, yeah, I'm yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, but it's one of the things that I want to put in the book because I think it's an important artifact. Um, it's an important thing in relationship to time and with the way that we think about art history. Um, it's it's something that I, I love that her as an artist, that she felt the agency to speak out against something that she felt was important to say. Sure. So that is one of the things in which why I was like, oh, this is. That was a motivation. That right. was a yeah. motivation. That was a motivation. Right. Um, but when it comes down to, like, the content of it, I mean, that that's like, you know, just chatter or like whatever opinions uh, we have. But yeah. Um, I would have loved. I think earlier. So earlier we had lunch, um, and we're talking about the painting, and we're talking about the biennial, um, and one of the things that I find to be fantastic about having those conversations, especially with some distance now, um, is that everybody has their thing that like really was a part of it that pissed them off. Um, and so I really would have loved to see a panel of painters talking, talking about the painting. Talking about the painting, yeah. And I don't think that the painting should get more power than it had, but I would love a painterly perspective where it's like a person that writes about painting. I had like all these panels that I designed in my mind. It was like Jennifer Packer and Tomashi Jackson and you know, like, you know, those types of things. Yeah. And that was like a fantasy of mine that I wanted to see, but it just didn't happen. It was more about the spectacle. Yeah. Um, so that, that was kind of my area of thought. Cause like for me, I had a lot of beef institutionally where I was like, okay, every time that there's a Whitney Biennial, maybe there can be a town hall. Maybe there can be these infrastructures for how we talk about some of the issues raised in it because there's so many things that, I mean, the, the beauty of the biennial is that it is a um, recurring exhibition that very much responds to America in that moment. Uh, we should be talking about some of the issues that these artists are responding to, yeah. right? There should yeah. be open forum and dialogue to be able to tease through these things with the hope that perhaps we won't have the same problem in two years. Yeah. Um, but that's not always how it exists right now. Right. Um, and But I think that that was an opportunity to really be able to say like, okay, let's have a conversation about motherhood. Let's have a conversation about race. Let's have a conversation about painterly gestures and, and cultural appropriation and yeah. ownership. Um, but, yeah, Yeah, because it just sort of, it, yeah, it sometimes, because I was like thinking about that painting, thinking about the Twitter, Vanessa Place Twitter project, and then just this weekend I was reading about, you know, um, the kind of debate over um, David Francis, the death and life of Marsha P. Johnson, who was like the, you know, black drag queen, who was sort of integral to um, um, Stonewall. And it just seems like, yeah, that these kind of questions of like, black life and black pain and who gets the, who has the right to sort of represent it seem to be kind of recurring. Um, but it's especially important with a story like Marsha B. Johnson, like as a woman, as a trans woman, yeah. and a time where that was, it, there was just incredible violence 
um, but her, for her to be outspoken, yeah. and then also for us not to have access to that history, and then the work, that's why Raina, that's why Raina's such an important slide, um, the work that she did to uncover that history. Um, anyway, yeah, yeah I, I, get, I get hot. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. no. <laughs> but, but that, I don't know, it's a strange thing, that whole moment, and the gaslighting, it's, like, it's crazy. Yeah, yeah, I knew, I heard an interview, it, it was, gaslighting is the right, Sardis. gaslighting is the right word. Um, uh, okay, so like just thinking about the, the. So homework, because we yes. can really get into it. So oh, homework yeah. is, sorry. <laughs> so homework is uh, Teen Vogue did an incredible, or Raina Gossett wrote an incredible piece for Teen Vogue recently about the experience. And then additionally, Janet Mock wrote for Allure about the experience as well. So that's your homework after this. Mm -hmm. so we're not just like insider gaming it. Yeah, oh, sorry. Um, so, so the thumbnail, you know, sometimes I like look at this and it feel, I know it's, these all, these represent different moments in time, but there's something about it that this too feels curated, like the relationship between the thumbnails. Um, uh, uh, you know, let me think, is there another one? Yeah. So, um, do you think of these, the templates as like also having a kind of cure, you know, a, a look or it's part of your, no? Okay. Cause it, hap I, it happens cause I that way, but it's really not intentional. It's not intentional. I also think like as a Tumblr baby, like yeah. you think about individual pieces of content. You don't think about like how it, right? Right? Like you think about, sorry, that's my homegirl. Um, yeah, you yeah, think okay. about like individual moments and instances. And for me, especially on on, Twi on Instagram, it's really, like I said, like, just so I don't forget. Like I honestly could not tell you where I was last Thursday. Like okay. full stop. But I do check my Instagram sometimes for confirmation. For and confirmation it's, and where you are. Yeah, yeah, like yeah, it's yeah, a mixture yeah. of like checking yeah. GCAL and yeah. Instagram and that's just the real of it. Yeah. Um, but there's sometimes when things do come together or like there's, uh, I don't I think I took that, Which it was in my other version of the, the thing, but like there were three images that I posted concurrently um, because there were three different artists looking at, so I posted the Carrie James Marshall black police officer. I posted oh, yeah. um, I, that's in the there. Jason Keeling um, handcuffs and then also uh, Jennifer Packer's uh, painting of a police officer. And so I was just thinking about the ways in which some black artists have responded to prison industrial complex and then also state violence. Okay. Um, but that's probably like the last time I can remember that I was like, I'm gonna finish this thought through Instagram. I see. Um, but normally it's just like. Normally it's not that way. Here's a selfie, okay. here's an artwork. Okay. I'm at Facebook, I'm in Palm Springs. Okay. I'm, you know, okay. in Berkeley. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, that if that's that that answers my question. Um, it's not as frequent as I thought, as as my eye was telling me. No, I think <laughs> everybody like I think uh, it's funny because there's like those accounts, you know, when people do like the nine squares and try to like show you one image, and I'm like, this is so irritating. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants a ninth of a picture. Right. Okay. <laughs> Like, who the hell is, like, typing in the URL to go to Instagram page? Like, what an antiquated idea. It's like, no, you're seeing the way in which the algorithm is feeding you these bits of content. And if you and if you treat them in the way that you, with an understanding of how the algorithms work, like, that's how you get it popping. Yeah. It's not about, like, it's always, always about, like, these aesthetics of, like, it's like, no one's going to look at your profile. Yeah. Like, who the hell? Yeah. Like, your ex is looking at your profile. <laughs> <laughs> but that's so, it. So, so, um, I... So I have another question, and it, we kind of started to talk about this on the phone, and I'm, it's about Venice. Okay. okay, so I have a question about black figuration on the, on the Instagram. My observation is that um, there, or my, I have a sense that there's very little of what we would call black abstraction on your Instagram, um, or, or on either site, that, that that it's that it's a lot about sort of figurative work. We'll talk about figurative work in a minute. Um, but okay, so I wanted to like you said, oh, you have more to teach me about Mark Bradford than I do. So I want to just look at those. These are the, these are photos of Mark Bradford's installation at the Venice at the American Pavilion of the Venice Biennale um, this year. Uh, the photos I took, so I take all responsibility for weird things like cutting off the top of that piece um, over there. It's like hanging from the ceiling, yeah. this one. Oh right. yeah, so that's it's hanging huge. from the ceiling. Um, that's the most I could get of it. Um, 
but it's in the American Pavilion, and the American Pavilion is, it, the building itself looks like, it could appear on the campus of Smith College. It looks like Monticello. Or it could be on the, yeah, the or it could be on the campus of UVA or Monticello, right. So that's the neoclassical look. Um, and uh, there's a way, you know, um, there's a degree, there's always a degree to which the blackness in black abstraction is subject to question, right? What's black about black abstraction? You know, it's always sort of there as a question. Um, and my experience of kind of walking through that space, I don't, I'm not prone to reading works of art allegorically, and in fact, I try to like really discipline myself to not say, oh, the work is really about something else that we can't see. It's, you know, it's referring to something else. But I have to say, as I was walking through Bradford and the American Pavilion, I felt like, wow, crazy. This is all about race. I mean, but that's Mark, too. Like, there's very few things, and this is like, I am not the authority on Mark Bradford's work, <laughs> um, but there's so much of his work that really is in reference to something else through abstraction. Like yeah, that's yeah, one yeah. Of his great strengths. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. I mean, you know, that whole. He's an artist who knows where he comes from. He's an artist who knows where he comes from. And he's there still. Right. And so there's right. something about like him being able to close this circle that I feel like enables him as a person working through abstraction. I mean. He even like he, you should listen to. There's videos of him on YouTube talking about Clifford Still. It's like you get yeah. like where his brain is at, yeah. especially because he's like. I mean, he's such. A, he's anyway. But like, anyway. You're yeah. Gonna, you talk. I'll, I'll listen. Oh, oh no! I love listening to you. I'm like, no, no, no. I, um, I, I, I mean, I sort of felt like the work. It's about the ugliness at the heart of America. I mean, that, you know, it's weird to look at these beautiful canvases and like you have to negotiate around like that stuff, you know, that's so cancerous, you know, like it just felt to me like, and knowing Mark, knowing his work, yeah, I would agree with you, he knows where he comes from, but it felt to me like, you know, what mattered um, um, was almost like the theatricality of walking through that space. Um, and I see that in this type of black abstraction, there's this kind of, um, there's, there's a way in which I sort of, the reason I sent you these images is because you, you you posted a few photos of the of this piece um, on the Instagram page, but I did think like it's hard to kind of communicate what's black about this. Um, there's Do you some... feel like that's a priority? Is it? <laughs> I mean, I, d I don't ever post anything because I'm like, oh, this is really black. I post things, especially on Instagram. It's like I I think that this is important. Yeah. I think that this is something worth highlighting. Yeah. I think that this is something worth someone else building their own opinion on too. Um, even on on black contemporary art too. Like it's black contemporary art because it's about where people are from. Um, it's about like a historic kind of uh, heritage perspective more so than saying this work is directly in communication with an aesthetic blackness or black culture. Okay. Um, and I've been really adamant about that and I've gone into many debates about it. But for me, I'm like, if you're black, you're on the site. Like if you're a black practitioner, you're on the site. Yeah. Um, and there are some people who have been like, I don't identify as that. I'm like, great, bye. Um, yeah. Your work's gone. Um, <laughs> but, but it was never about the subject matter being explicitly black. There's a lot of okay. artwork that does do that, and I think it's awesome. Yeah. Like I'm all about identity politics, yeah. obviously, um, but it, it's not always that goal. But if you want to know more about black abstraction, would love to shout out the Four Generations book that just came out. Yeah, um, yeah. the Joiner yeah, collection, yeah. Um, who's a San Franciscan, yeah. Um, so could we talk about some of the figurative work that you posted? Because um, I know you, you say you love it, so I want to, um, so, uh, Lynette Iadum Boake at the New Museum. No, this uh, is at Pulitzer. Oh, this, oh, whoops, sorry. The other one's from the New Museum. Oh, wait. Yeah, this oh, is New Museum. Oh, this one is from the New Museum. Right, yeah. Right, right. The other one is from the Pulitzer Art Foundation. Uh, Glenn Ligon curated Black and Blue exhibition there. Um, right. Stunning show. Really? Yeah. yeah. Wow, okay, I didn't see that. Um, oops, sorry, I'm going backwards. Uh, my favorite. And this is at SF MoMA. Yeah. This is here. Yeah, this is but here. But this was in, yeah, in December. Um, you saw Arthur Jaffa. Yes. Could you talk about it? Yeah. Because I didn't see it. And it, it, uh, just reading the, inst the post, you clearly were moved. I was in a moment, yeah. first of all. Um, anyway. 
<laughs> much to be said about that. But at any rate, um, it's one of those interesting things. So the, the film, most one of the m most, not most recent, that's not actually accurate, but one of the big shows that he did in New York uh, was a screening at Gavin Brown Enterprises in Harlem of a film called Love is a Message, the Message is Death. And I sat for, I think, an hour and a half watching and re-watching this film and then he went shot by shot about everything that was going on in the film. And I was just beside myself. It's a film where you laugh and you cry and you just like, your entire spirit is moved no matter what your background is. And so to know that you haven't seen it, like I can honestly say to you, your life isn't as good as it could be. Mm. Like that's how good it is. Yeah. Like I that's how good I it totally is. I totally trust you. Yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, but when you encounter those kinds of things that just like shake, like there's a shift, like, in you in the way that you're viewing things and also just a confirmation. Like his work is, he's such a, an um, amazing uh, observer of the world and he was kind of like the original Tumblr kid um, because he uh. used to make these binders of images that he was seeing and make these really strange obtuse collages and it's like, it's so fucking Tumblr but uh, way before it existed. Yeah. Um, but for him as a person who takes these bits of media that like, and then to hear him go shot for shot, he is he has this romantic relationship with the images that he he pulls and, and, and cares for, right? Yeah. Um, and so I, I wanted to feature him as part of this yeah. dialogue because he I see so much of my own practice in his practice right. where there's this like incredible love affair with some of the images. Like that's an image of I think it's his son. Uh-huh. Um, but there's this incredible like commitment to and communication with these videos that he pulls together as part of the collage of that film. Right, right. Okay, cool. and then... Whoops. So the film, he also... So the, the audio that plays with the film is... Yeah. Um, ul, uh, is it Ultralight Beam? I think it's Ultralight Beam. Um, and he, like, remixed Ultralight Beam, and then it's a 20-minute video that is a collage of different videos that he found on YouTube, um, and then some from his own films. But it's about... It's largely about black life. Um, that's a really shallow read of it, but I encourage you all, if you have access to or an opportunity to see the film, it will... It, it, I can't say enough. I love it. He's also a Sag, so I'm like a Leo, and I'm like, oh my God, any Sag who's like doing great stuff, I'm like, woo, I'm the biggest supporter. <laughs> it's and, the stars, really. And these are, these are, these are, um, screenshot, screenshots from his f FaceTime. Yeah, so he, so he took these screenshots, and they're prints, um, and this was an exhibition that he did at the uh, Serpentine Galleries. Okay. In Which was also way. really cool. So as you work your way through the gallery, there are headphones. So it's like this audio sensory experience and he curates the sound. And then there's these videos that are playing of all these like different source videos. And so there's, uh, I don't know, it was, it was dope. That's great. It's difficult to explain if you don't okay. get a chance okay. to see it. Um, and then uh, they have Carrie James Marshall at the Met. Um, I, uh, I was thinking that your posts, ver, ver, they're very often about like um, seeing ourselves seeing, and that there's some, that's, I mean, I, I saw the Carrie James Marshall in LA, and it's just, it's, tr it's it was ex extraordinary how moved people were, like by the, by see, in a way seeing themselves in this work. Um, and, uh, yeah. So anyway, I I love I just loved this particular post because I think it really captured my experience of the show. Yeah. Um, and I love this post too. Obviously, it's mine. Um, <laughs> but uh, this one is one that I really wanted to include here because uh. the person in this picture, I saw him taking this picture. I tapped him on the shoulder and asked him for permission to take his picture. Um, and I think that that's sometimes something that like I think is really weird about internet culture, where especially like thinking about like something like Afropunk or like these festivals in which black people ordain themselves for themselves, um, and then their picture is taken without consent. And so I, I, I really love this moment, because even like he says thank you, because yeah. we had an interaction. Yeah. We had a conversation before I posted this picture, and I feel like if there's something I want to impress upon anybody is like, this conversation can happen, it can be really productive, you can build a relationship. His Instagram account is also popping, and I wouldn't have had access to it if I didn't talk to him and ask him what if his handle was so I could properly shoulder, yeah. tag. Um, and in the same way that you know you probably credit an artwork, like probably crediting people for their own image I think is really important, especially when you're thinking about representing marginalized communities. Yeah. Um, but that aside, this night was 
amazing at the Met. So it was a Friday night and people were dressed to the nines. Sure. Okay, like there was this like, it was like Easter Sunday kind of vibe in terms of the way that people were dressing for to go see an art show. Yeah. Um, but it was felt, it was just like this sense of pride and there was just like this posture that people had as they moved to the galleries and, and then to know that they showed up for someone like Carrie who is just one of the most like incredible human beings yeah. um, and truly loves the folk. And so for people, especially for brown people to show up to the Met, like and yeah. like ready, like we know what we're gonna see, yeah. we know yeah. where to go and we're gonna yeah. get our pictures for the gram. Like it was a really spectacular thing and I don't like being at work late on a Friday night, but I was like, there's nowhere else in the world I'd rather be yeah. than right here. Yeah, it was similar in Los Angeles. It really was. Um, uh, it was an extraordinary show. Oh, and then there, this, yeah, this is another post. This, this is, Carrie James Marshall, um, when you talk about the absence of black figure representation, yeah. Um, all right. Oh uh, yeah. So this is this. This is these are the three images that I was talking about. Oh. So this is the the bottom right is the Jennifer Packer painting uh, of the police officer, and then there's the Jason Keeling handcuffs, and then the top over there is the Carrie James, James Marshall. Marshall. Okay. So that was curated. Yeah. I that see. was like I was yeah. on the way to work, yeah. and I was like. Yeah. You know what? These three paintings really should be in conversation. Yeah. Okay. It's like, where's the show about black people making images of police officers? Um, can we talk about Black Art Incubator? Yeah. Okay. So, um, where is it and who is it? Yeah, so the next slide is who is oh, it? Oh, next slide is Oh, no. Oh, wait. Oh, no, I didn't give you that slide. Just kidding. Okay, so <laughs> <laughs> what is it? Uh, the Black Art Incubator was a group that I founded with three of my best girlfriends. Um, it actually started over a drinks conversation, which is where all the best ideas start. Um, but I was out to drinks with Jessica Lynn, who is a name you should write down if you're doing homework after this, um, queen of my heart. She and I sat down and basically had a conversation about the things we were frustrated about. Um, we were irritated by the lack of information about how to get more resources in the art world. We were irritated by the fact that there's not really a clear path towards success. Mm -hmm. We were irritated by the fact that um, we knew that we had community in each other, but that a lot of people didn't feel like they had access to that. We were also irritated by the fact that there's not a lot of spaces to co-work in New York, um, a city that everybody's literally working all the time, but mm -hmm. you can't like put yourself down somewhere and really get, get the stuff done. It's not a library um, where you have to be quiet. Um, and so through that dinner conversation, we came to the idea of uh, making a collective. Um, so we decided to loop in Taylor Aldridge, who is now a curator at the DIA in Detroit. Mm -hmm. um, Jessica, Lynn, and Taylor work on a blog called Arts.Black, which is an art blog that is dedicated to art criticism from a black perspective. It is awesome. They do it, they, they do it exceptionally well. Um, and then the fourth person is Jessica Bell Brown, mm -hmm. who is an amazing art historian and longtime friend of mine. We, uh, we met my first summer in New York working at Creative Time. We were both fellows there. And uh, Jessica is an amazing writer on painter and an abstract, black abstraction. Um, mm -hmm. And we all came together and decided that we wanted to build something like a social sculpture, which I realize is the worst language now, but we all make mistakes. Um, but we were like, okay, how can we build a project um, and build a space and take on a residency space as artists and practitioners um, to solve these problems, to solve um, these issues of access, to challenge the ways in which some of these um, worlds are seen as really separate from each other. Um, do you want to go to the next yeah. slide? So we, we built four different streams of programming to be able to tackle these issues. So the first is art and money. So we were like, okay, so why is it that the same people who own some of the artworks or the same people whose names are on the wall or the same people who um, are donors in other ways or whatever. Um, and so we invited program officers from foundations. We invited people, gallerists who are selling artworks. We invited people who are grant writers um, and put them all within the same series. And so you could, if you were to have the time to attend all of those programs, you could think more uh, expansively about yeah. how commerce works in the art world. Right. Um, and then art criticism, we invited uh, curators and critics to uh, review portfolios, but we also did like a group crit space because we found that, or we had a frustration with the fact that either you go through an MFA or BFA program and then artists leave those programs and then there's not a lot of space for criticism, um, yeah. for having really open dialogue about artworks, or if you're a person who perhaps comes to your practice later in life, or if you're a person who comes to their practice outside of institutions, yeah. maybe you never have access have to, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, and then archiving was something that I took on myself because 
I think it is so incredibly important for people who come from marginalized communities to tell our own stories, but we don't always have the tools to do so. Um, so I invited Sir Rodney Sir, who was a, uh, an artist um, and uh, archivist. Um, I invited uh, Helene Aroma, who is a performance art archivist, which I thought was a really fun wow. way of thinking about yeah. archiving. Um, and then the last one was office hours, which was just general uh, opportunities for people who are professionals to have conversations and to try to expand the ways in which they saw the work that they were doing in the art world. Um, and so we made 30 programs that were all free to the public um, and did our damnedest to try to solve some of these problems within the five weeks that we had there. Oh, okay, so it, so it, was, a fi it's, it, it was in that space for five weeks. Okay, okay, wow. Um, ah, and now. Yeah, I love that photo. It's so sad, but it's so great. I know. <laughs> I was like, I need I to know. find a better picture of Jenna and I that's not so freaking depressing, but I love this one so much. Um, and Emmanuel, who took it, is such a sweetheart, amazing black photographer. Um, it was a good day. So the book, it's a book. It's going to be a book. What What's it going to be about? Yeah, the black, so black Futures is going to be a book. Yeah, so Jenna Wortham, who another person to write down if you're doing homework after this, Jenna is a writer uh, and critic for the New York Times magazine, um, and then also literally the queen of my heart. Um, we came together through DMs, actually. She sent me a DM two years ago and was just like, I want to make a zine about black culture. I'd love for you to be involved. And we went out for lunch, and I was like, we're not making a zine because a zine is something that is going to end up in some obscure-ass bookshop, um, yeah. maybe in like one or two collections, and it's going to be this thing that you have to do a lot of work to access. We're making a book. We're going to do it proper. Yeah. Um, and we got a book deal. And because I'm crazy, yeah. um, but I was just like, if we're gonna put all this effort into this, and we have, you know, someone's gonna give us a book deal. Like I was like, I know this is gonna happen. Um, and then we did, and I was like, oh my god, they give us a book deal? Like <laughs> we're crazy. Um, but at any rate, uh, our book is gonna come out on One World Imprint, which is uh, edited by Chris Christopher Jackson, who is another person to write down and research. He's amazing. Um, he was also Toni Morrison's editor and Ta-Nehisi Coates' editor, and we're like, oh my god, you want to give us a book? Wow. <laughs> yeah. Um, but at any rate, we decided to make this book. Um, and one of the great hopes of the book is to be able to um, create a kind of like a time capsule for what it means to be black and alive right now. Um, that's kind of the short pitch of it. Okay. Um, because as any scholar of black studies knows, that there's always these like larger anthologies or books that really look at an era or time. But with the exception of The Fire This Time, I think is the Jasmine yeah, Jones yeah, book, Jasmine, um, huh? there hasn't been one that really effectively catalogs what's been going on right now, especially with a really keen look at social media, especially with the consideration that social media, there's not really a facility to properly archive it. And then to think about how much black cultural production goes on there is like, ooh, we gotta step in and intervene and do something to really be able to hold all these stories in one place. Right. And we felt that the technology of the book refuses extinction in the way that, or expiration in the way that uh, social media kind of yeah, yeah, lets yeah, us yeah, out yeah, for. Yeah. That makes sense. It's a, it's a project about preservation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And love. And love. And love yeah. and black people. Um, so I thought maybe we could open the floor to questions now. All right. Um, where are our, our mics? And we'll bring a mic to you if anybody yes, needs. Yes, we'll bring a mic to you. Oh, don't be shy. Oh. Oh, Random House. Yeah. I work as a gallery coordinator at Betty. I'm a gallery coordinator <laughs> at Betty Ono. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, I see, I see. All right. My name is Ryan Austin Dennis. I'm a gallery coordinator at Betty Ono. Uh, we have a show up called Black Women Over Breathing. Check it out. Um, my question is really about team building and collaboration and how to facilitate that. Because right now, actually, I actually have some people who I work with called like the Black Aesthetic, and it's a project we do. It's like an ongoing film screening. And it's like, I've always wanted to know, like through whether, through all your projects, like how do you make sure you meet the right people? How do you create a culture where people can plug in or plug out? And yeah, that's what I'm really curious about. And, also, just knowing historically through multiple like different like black collectives, like you know what what works and what doesn't work. 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I don't. I'm not sure that I have the answer for what works and doesn't work. But l like you were saying, there's many examples of things that have not worked. Um, for me, what's been really successful, uh, especially for the Black Art Incubator, uh, was that we would have, in the same way that we had business meetings, we'd have check-ins. Like, how are you doing? You no, know, how are you doing? And you can hold the floor on, um, on your feelings. Uh, and really, there was just like, are you drinking water? Like. Jenna and I have a really um, incredible relationship where every meeting that we start, we just give a download of like the last week of our lives. We meet every Sunday. Um, and it's so much about, you know, you're so much more than your productivity, which is why that like love note is so important to me. Um, I think if there's anything that for me has been successful, and I'm relatively new to the whole like collective work thing, like I'm an only child, I'm really all about my thing and like being dependent on myself. Um, but having other people and knowing that you can trust them because they actually care for you as a person is really, really important. And, and I think that that's slow work. So there's not really a magic solution, but I do think that there's a feeling that you have when you're like, oh, this person has my best interest at heart, which means that you know we can collectively work together. There's a level of, of giving that you feel more comfortable with. And, and I think that that shows up in the rigor that you bring to any project. Um, but if you ever, I don't know, that, that's, that's been, the most successful strategy for me, but I'm like a sensitive, feely person. Um, yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Teju, and I know a lot in contemporary black art, there's been a lot of conversations about appropriation as a negative thing, and appropriation is not inherently a negative word, but when it's associated kind of with, with blackness and what's been happening culturally, it's kind of seen as this inherently bad thing, and a lot of black people appropriate things from uh, parts of the diaspora in a way that is not at all offensive. So I wonder if you could share your opinions about the connection between appropriation and race as it has to do with black contemporary art. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Which isn't like a cop out, but I think it's, it's important to like, when we have these conversations to have specifics, right? Which I know that you have. Um, so I'm not saying that the question is in any way not that. Um, but I do think that there's something really important in terms of it being an opportunity to research and better better understand gestures and, and symbols and signifiers. Um, I think that that's something that we all have a commitment to doing. Like, so long as we're breathing, we should be learning. Um, and so whenever there's a conversation about appropriation, and I'm, I'm interested in access and information and how we can have a more expansive idea around culture. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a weird it's a weird thing like visibility and, and power and virality, especially when it comes to uh, black images online. It's 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 something that I'm always constantly thinking about, especially because like I'm in the very privileged position to be able to say like this cup is great, and then people are like, oh my god, that cup is great. Um, and and what does that mean? And then what ways in, are are these cups subject to uh, a surveillance or visibility that these cups may not be ready for? These cups may be like now in jeopardy because people see this cup and they want to do what the cup did, but the, they don't have ownership to the historical knowledge that the cup has. Um, <laughs> so that's something that I'm always thinking through. But I think it's a, a really about a responsibility. Um, and even when we're on the other side of calling out the people who are stealing from the cups, like how do we do that in a way that's productive? Right, um, because these are opportunities to learn. Right, we're we're learning how to be better communicators. People are learning about cultures that may not be their own. Um, is a lot, is a lot. But I've you know, I don't shy away from conversations about it when there's specific instances. Um, but I do think it's really something that like it's a case by case. Uh, hi, uh, my name is oops, Kinjin, and uh, I just graduated from a curatorial practice program. Uh, where we are final, obviously the final project is to create an exhibition. In that moment, I realized, now that you just said it, there, that there was a moment that you struggled between the ways curators kind of have conversations that always end up with a product or there's something that has to kind of come from the work you put into your time with an artist. So you're, technically that's what's supposed to happen, but there are now these moments where you realize that that may not be what you want to do, so then does that mean I'm not a curator if I, want to have these pasta dinners, <laughs> but I want to also like work with them because then there's this no-no of like collaborating, you're not the artist, don't act like you guys are equal. So there's all of these um, historical structures uh, that we're engaging with that I think you did a really good job at like finding the ways the in-between worked for you 
and not identifying as these like specific things. Do you have advice for people who are also struggling with those kind of liminal spaces of kind of seeing where they're trained as an art, like I was trained in art history, so I have these very romantic ideas of what you're supposed to do with that. But now being in the world, um, I'm much more comfortable in the in-between as well. And so if you have any advice for people who had that same experience. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's, um, it's a long game, which is cop-out answer, but I think if there's artists that you wanna have relationships with that are outside of this kind of like museum industrial complex, I just made that up. <laughs> I like it though. I'm gonna keep it in the sentence. Um, but if you wanna have like an actual long lasting relationship with someone or even thinking about like, I, there's curators who've known artists for 20 years and never put them in an exhibition. I mean, I think that there's something about being earnest and committed to the work um, without the assumption, I mean, it's like an integrity thing, right? So it's like, what are you gonna dedicate your time to when no one's looking? Um, and I think that those are the things that can be the most fulfilling. Sometimes it's just the quiet work. But uh, and I don't know, if you keep knocking on that door that you wanna knock on, like at some point someone's gonna let you in or they don't deserve your knock and like, bye, you know? I don't know. Um, we actually had a question over here. If you could talk more about Carter Woods. Oh, Carter G. Woodson? Yeah. Yeah, so let's go to that slide. Um, so I love starting with the Carter G. Woodson slide because he was the founder of Negro History Week. And um, this this quote has, like when I found it, I think I found it on Tumblr, but it's always stuck with me. Um, if a race has no history, it has no worthwhile tradition, it becomes a negligible factor in the thought of the world and it stands in danger of being exterminated. Um, and it's been a guiding principle for the way that I think about the work that I do online. Um, it's a guiding principle for even like doing the book project because I know um, that there's so many ways in which people could look at this time and be like, black people weren't doing shit. Correct. But I can, you know, I can use the, power that I have and the energy that I have to inscribing in history to say like, we were doing so much great stuff. Yeah. Um, or even like, where's PJ? Like PJ doing the same thing where it's like, he PJ you should follow on, on the Instagrams and the internets, um, but building his Philipp Philippine X, is that how you say it out loud? Um, library, but finding these histories that you're really committed to and saying we existed in this time and this time and this time and in these many varied ways. Um, I think that this quote speaks to that and that as a, as a, a dedicated thing because it is that it like exterminate is such an extreme word and that's how I feel like there's this urgency to record and to share. Um, but yeah. Uh, yeah. How's it going? Um, Hello. By the way, love what you're doing. Absolutely amazing and pleasure to have you here. Uh, my name is Adu and my question is how, um, how are you bridging the gap when it comes to, I guess, um, the traditional practices and ways that you're showing art? Not, like for instance, I guess what I'm trying to say is that you know, so often I feel like with technology, specifically social media already, it's like you run into the issue of how things are being done, even, and particularly even when you think about Kevin Hart and how he has like pretty much utilized social media when it comes to his comedy, but then you have a lot of um, comedians that came before him, you know, saying things of his nature in, in regards to like his technique and different things of that nature. So as you're curating, how are you, um, and is it important to you, you know, to bridge the gap? And how, how do you feel, or like, what do you feel is the best way to bridge the gap when it comes to individuals that are used to the traditional way of viewing art in a museum, and then also bringing them along so that you're not missing that audience, but you're also kind of bringing them along with you as you're moving along? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, in practice, it's, it's really, for me, been important to both walk in confidence of the work I'm doing and then also understand that there's still so much that I have to learn. Um, and so I try to arrive so humbly into all the spaces because I feel like when you're humble, you can learn the most. Um, so I do arrive in like academic spaces um, or I do go to conferences and, and learn about how people are speaking about art more in more traditional senses and then try to apply that that work to the, to the work that I'm doing online. Um, but when it comes down to it, I mean, I think, like I was saying earlier, social media is a tool um, social media isn't, I mean, some people do it really well where like the um, the digital object is the thing. And, and I really love that kind of work too. But for me, I'm not saying that the JPEG is the work of art. 
I'm saying that the JPEG is a possibility. The JPEG is something that might motivate you to go see the work. The JPEG is something that might motivate you to know more about the artist. The JPEG is something that might motivate you for, to find something that you like more than a JPEG. Um, so, so that's m the work that I'm doing. Um, it, it's more of like a wayfinding device than anything else um, and presenting the possibility of an experience. Okay. Oh, in the back and then in the front row. Hi, Kim. My name is Claudia. And um, I apologize in advance if my question isn't fully formed yet. I'm still kind of thinking through it. Um, but I'm just listening to you talk. And I'm a former uh, digital communications specialist for a local museum here. You got in the out. Bay. And <laughs> yes, um, thinking a lot about your position as a woman of color in a predominantly white institution in this role of social media and also as a, young, a younger person than I'm assuming most of the staff are, um, without asking you to put your place of work on blast too much, um, I'm just interested in like hearing your thoughts about um, the role that you play in the institutional um, side of your work, and then also your work outside as Museum Mammy and as the curator of your Tumblr. Um, do you see them as complementary? Do you ever feel like there's tension between the two roles that you, that you play, um, kind of one in the institutional sense and one in maybe sort of more of your passion work? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I don't really think of them in really separate ways. Uh, there is a level of professionalism that I try to bring to everything I do. It's like annoying almost sometimes because I'm like, I feel, I feel an incredible duty to getting it right. Um, I feel an incredible responsibility to showing up and being the best version of myself because I'm an overachiever, like obviously. Um, I do like a million things. Uh, but when it comes down to working within the institution, I also realize that I have I have a lot of power. It's crazy, um, and so when things happen that don't please me, I'm the first one to say something. Like I'm the first one to send an email and say I felt disrespected in this exchange because I know I have the power to do that, and perhaps my peers who are on the same junior level don't. Um, and so I have a very no bullshit approach to the work that I'm doing, and it feels so good because I think a lot about the weight, especially that we can carry as, as young people across the board, as people who represent marginalized communities, where people say some messed up things, and then they continue to say them because no one's challenged them on it. Um, and so I try to, as respectfully as possible, because I, you know, uh, I'm like a, you know, I try to have good karma. Um, but I, I, I try to articulate myself in a way that expresses, like, this isn't going to work for me. Um, and I feel really committed to doing that work. And then there's been very few instances at the museum that it's come up. One happened on Thurs on Friday night, which is also so. <laughs> there was this other backstory. So there was a different slide show. <laughs> and I thought I would emailed Steven, the original one, and I didn't. But it was because I was, like, going back, to for back and forth with this person because I was irritated. Um, and exhausted, but at any rate, that's neither here nor there. Um, but I've, I've been really committed to saying, okay, this is wrong, um, and, and and articulating why, because I think sometimes too, um, especially because of social media, it's really easy to say like, rah, rah, this is wrong. Um, but I like to do the slow work of saying like, this is how we can do better together, because um, I'm committed to um, understanding critique as an act of care as well. Um, but I have to, the short answer for your question is I, I don't play games at the Met, <laughs> and I don't play games in my personal life either. <laughs> Literally, I have no games on my phone. <laughs> okay, in the front row. Hello, Kimberly. Yeah, right on, welcome to the West Coast. My name is Phoenix, and I was wondering, I'm, I'm a big fan of Artsy. I have my critiques about them, but overall, I'm a fan of what they're doing. And I was curious, um, would Black Futures kind of be like a, a Black Artsy, or do you feel the need for a Black Artsy? I'm wondering why there's no, Black art online being sold heavily and pushed. It's like the same five to maybe six people, you know, same artists who are, you know, not emerging anymore, right? They're like post, post, post emerging. Um, where is the black artsy? And do you think there's a need for like black auction, just that whole push? I don't know. I mean, I could ask you the same question. Um, I think I encourage people to take whatever role in the art world they want to take on. There are some amazing black gallerists out there. There's some great black gallerists here in, in the Bay Area. Um, but I don't work on the commercial side. I would be really bad at it. Like, I don't barter well. Um, I overpay for a lot of stuff. Um, I worked in a gallery for like a hot second, but I was on the communication side, and I was all about like 
making the gallery world more transparent. Everybody was like, mm -mm, that's not what we do over here. Um, <laughs> quit that, go back to museums. Um, but yeah, so I don't have a good answer for that question. I also try my damnedest not to think about art in relationship to commerce whenever I can. Um, whenever I'm thinking about money, I'm thinking about access to museums. Um, and that's really where my brain puts most of its, if not all of its energy when it comes down to money. Um, but it's interesting because someone earlier was like pressing me on like the price work, price of artworks. I'm like, that's not my beat. Like find someone whose beat that is and ask them because they could give you a much better answer. That's why I built black contemporary art. I mean, or not why I built it, but that's one of the functions of it now. Yeah, so the refinement was um, building a space that people could encounter more work by black artists. Uh, black art as an optic cleanse, not necessarily for commerce, although I think that's needed to build out a, a economic, an alternative economic security for black people now and into the future, but also um, just a point of collections and cleansing, the optic cleanse, so that they can see themselves in the artwork, collect it and pass, pass it down, sort of the way there are collections that are like, we've had this for a hundred years, and now it's gone into the Met or gone into some other museum, but we know the family that's held on to that Picasso or held on to that whatever piece of artwork, do you know what I'm saying? I don't know of any black artwork that's like, oh, this this has been around for 100 years and it's been collected by a black family. It's in their collection. Do you get me? Where is that, I feel like Artsy is trying to push that out by cataloging with their editorials and then you know being able to collect really fine artwork, but a lot of it is still not by black people. So I guess my, my ultimate question is, do you, and it maybe it's rhetorical, do you feel like there's a need for a black Artsy? And is that an urgent need, or do you think like the Tumblrs and the Instagrams and the other things we have out there will do, Black Twitter and such? Yeah, I mean, um, I would. R I'm really keen on more. So, like the Four Generations book, um, Pamela Joyner, uh, she's a Black woman um, and has been collecting Black abstraction um, for some time. Uh, I love, I would love for more, or like someone like Bernard Lumpkin, who's been really public in his collection, I would love for more black collectors to make themselves known, um, to make their collections known. Um, so from that vantage point, I'm like all about it. I mean, I'm also like, I wanna know as many black stories as I physically possibly can take into my body in my lifetime, right? Um, and especially when it relates to art, um, especially when it relates to the agency that collecting can, can give to um, to folks in a, in a good way, I think, in many ways, and then, of course, in other ways, because, like, money, ooh, weird. Um, but I don't know if there's, like, a, yeah, that, that that's the short of it. Like, I would love, I want to read, a, like, a book that has a list of names and, like, what they have and why they have it. Um, but that doesn't, to my knowledge, exist yet. Somebody might know about something. If you do, let me know. Uh, oh, wow, lots of hands. Oh, back back there, in the almost in the back row. Uh, what's going on? My name is Andrew Wilson. Um, I just finished my MFA here. Um, so question I have regarding, I guess, digital presence or online presence. Um, where do you think is this kind of boundary or way of mediating like the sacred space of the studio and then what folks have access to as a practitioner? Because um, I think that there are extremes that folks go through. Like, I'm on the extreme where I don't have any social media, and there are some folks that just post everything that they're doing in their studio. So how does one mediate that space as this becomes, like, our, um, I guess, way that we access, like, work, people, um, spaces, communities? I mean, I'm a big fan of, like I was saying earlier, um, understanding social media as labor, right? So if you don't feel like doing that work is something that will be helpful for you, don't. Like, I talk to people sometimes about social media and they're like, the Twitters and the Facebooks and it's so overwhelming and I'm just like, you don't have to do all of them. It's like, if you find one that works for you, 
um, and helps you to communicate in the ways that you want to communicate, go for it. Um, but I don't think that there's a catch-all answer for like whether or not or like how to even mediate that. It's, it's more of like a personal preference thing. Like some people are really process-based and really want to share a more iterative way of making. Um, but I think it's, it's a matter of like who the person is and how their practice operates. Like someone who works in two-dimensional drawings, like maybe the whip is really cool and they want to share that. But if you're a dancer and you're midway through working out the problems of your dance um, for this presentation that you're doing, like maybe it's not the best to show like a weird boomerang of you trying to work on something. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's a matter of like how it works in service of your like everyday life as a human person too. Malika. Uh, hello, I'm Malika. I'm a doctoral student here in Black Studies um, and I really like your shoes. <laughs> um, I've recently come into like a I don't know, just a real like love for black contemporary art, largely thanks to some professors that's around here. Um, and also into a little like black art creative community um, in the Bay Area. And I'm wondering, I guess my question, like art spaces, even black art spaces can sometimes be hella uncomfortable and um, can bring about all kinds of anxieties and not just because like the museum or the gallery is like a white space, but because of, you know, like attitude and ego and all the things. Um, so I guess I'm wondering how do you deal and how do you navigate um, and negotiate like space and sanity? Yeah, I love like, you know on Twitter where they're like, protect Vince Staples at all costs. Um, <laughs> like that's how I feel sometimes where I'm like, how can I protect my spirit right now? Like, cause especially in New York, there's such a currency of being present in space. Um, like, if you dip out, people are like, oh my God, where'd she go? And people are so damn nosy. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think it's, um, it's a matter of picking the spaces that you really want to be in um, and committing to that. Like, I think it's slower here, so you, you, your attention isn't as divvied in the way that, like, some people in more metropolitan, I guess this is metropolitan, but you know what I mean, like, city cities, um, like, New York City. <laughs> Here? Is it San Francisco called the town? I would love to help you right now. I don't know. Someone help me. It's different. Because for real, uh, like, I mean, no, in, I, in the New York I, art I world, you'll have like saying. 15 totally, things to go yeah. to in one day. On yeah. that doesn't happen here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's no shade. I mean, it's it's a thing. It's it's a beautiful thing. It's like why people you choose have to, to be live. On. Yeah, people to choose to live in different areas, yeah. um, and I think that that is, is a beautiful opportunity. There's different flavors. Like, there's a different flavor between Baltimore and New York. There's a different flavor between Baltimore and Detroit or Houston or whatever, what so have you. But at any rate, in the city that I've chosen to make my living in life, um, I often try to check in and say, like, what is my capacity for generosity today? Mm. And I think that asking yourself that will be the armor that you – kind of carry into those interactions and then also taking a no bullshit approach so if you're in a space that you're committed to and you feel like something isn't right it's like don't be the first person to tell yourself that that's a wrong instinct like call out what it is and try to resolve it um I think especially you know like I'm all like all over the place about gender but like I think that women sometimes can be really prone to saying like oh, it's not that bad, or like, it's not that, but it's like, if you, if you feel like in your spirit that something that someone has said to you really like upsets you, it's like, figure out what that is and how to resolve it. Don't figure out like whether or not that's true. It's like, know that that's true, that's your truth, and then work to resolve it in the spaces that you commit yourself to. If you don't feel committed to the space, run, like get out, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, right here. A couple more, okay. Hi, Hi, Kim Hi, Kimberly. Uh, shade aside, welcome to the Bay Area. <laughs> um, I swear it was a shade. <laughs> uh, so, um, you know, I'm really fortunate to, to know you a little bit, but now that I'm here with a little bit of distance, um, I'm just wondering, um, aside from blackness, I know there's a lot of other facets, um, you know, that you are uh, experienced and you also are... Um, familiarized with like fashion, technology, and nightlife, and queerness. And I'm just wondering how all of those kind of um, spaces and, and perspectives and worldviews influence um, the way that you approach all of your work, um, the book, the Tumblr, the writing, and also um, at the Met. So kind of, I think there isn't, you know, we aren't, the way that 
you have shown us multiplicities in in the way of you know, the way that we approach life and art and living i think is is inspiring and i think would be sort of um useful and important to sort of share so i'm just wondering how all of those kind of aspects um shape or inform the work that you do um now yeah that's a great question i I'm so interested in culture, right? Like I found myself in the art world, but I'm really invested in culture, especially because a lot of the lines that I'm drawing are around like a cultural group. Um, so being able to dance within these other worlds has been really fun for me. Um, one thing that I've been really interested in is talking to musicians or like thinking about the world of music specifically because it is a medium that I'm fascinated by in the ways in which it's democratic. So like if I play a song for you, I literally like said this earlier to Weston, so I'm repeating myself. Um, but I've been—it's something I've been thinking a lot about. Um, but if I play a song for you, um, you can say like, "I don't like that song," right? Um, but if I show you a painting, people are less apt to say, "I like this painting" or "I don't like this painting" because they feel like they have to have like a certain level of knowledge to be able to deem something worthy or not worthy. Um, and so I'm trying to like unpack the ways in which value judgments are made across different cultural kind of things. Um, so I'm really like spooked by the door a lot in a lot of things where I'm like, is this how fashion's doing this? Is this how music's doing this? Um, but then also too, it's like all these worlds are also in bed with each other too. Um, and so I, I love the, the ability to be able to go through them. It's like there's so many gallerists who are married to like fashion designers or like the ways in which like, you know, certain fashion brands like appropriate, like Coach did a collection with the Keith Haring Foundation. Like there's ways in which these worlds have been wed and married and especially from like a New York perspective and like the downtown scene, these worlds have never been separate, but they're starting to become separate for some strange reason. And I, I don't know, I love to be able to like interact across them. Um, but it is funny, so like some of our friends, uh, Angela, um, she does this lesbian party and she was like, we were so scared to ask you to host it because we didn't think you went out. And I was like, oh my God, I love that people don't know I go out. Like, <laughs> this is great. Um, but I love like, anyway, I love nightlife too um, because I feel like it's a freeing space. It's like within all of the ways in which um, I show up and be professional, like I love the opportunities to be like truly messy too because I'm a messy bitch. Um, <laughs> and sometimes you need the lights off to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question. <laughs> okay, we'll do two more. Okay. Yeah, yeah, There's two yeah. mics. There's two, yeah, two mics. Hi, Kimberly. I just wanted to thank you. I have been following the work that you do, and I find you very inspiring. And I've been sharing the work that you do across industries. I come from a legal background, and I've been sharing what you're doing because I think it applies in so many industries, across not just art, but in so many uh, industries where um, black people are. I think the work that you're doing is so important. Um, I work currently for a prestigious um, uh, San Francisco-based museum institution. <laughs> and, um, you know, a lot of conversations around diversity and inclusion have been coming up. And uh, one thing that I find myself in conflict with from time to time is that I, I'm happy to be a voice at the table because I'm, you know, one of maybe four black people that work at the institution. And so naturally, um, the conversations gravitate towards me. but. At the same time, I wasn't hired to do that type of work specifically. And so sometimes I kind of go back and forth and I'm just a a curious to know, like, what, you know, what do you see the role as people of color within traditionally white spaces? Um, you know, what is the role that we play when we're not specifically there to guide the museum through these issues uh, of diversity and inclusion, but you know, you're one of the few people that's there to speak to your experiences as a person of color. Uh, so yeah, I'm just curious to hear what your perspective is. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I mean, I think it's, it's interesting because, um, especially with diversity and inclusion, it's such a, a mixy issue in museums because it's like, if a light in the gallery breaks, the curator's not gonna fix it. It's like, the people have jobs and roles, and if you have identified an, ish, an area of issue in your institution, you find the right technician to resolve that issue. And that's not always the people of color on your staff, right? And I think that that's a mistake that's made often in museums where we feel like we have to be the first responder to these issues when these issues are infrastructural um, and have been around for a longer than a lot of us have been alive, right? Um, 
so I always I always go back and forth on those issues. But then I also think a lot about the people who came before me and and chose to make it their job, um, so that I could have a job. Um, and so there's, you know, those both of those things. Um, but I think it's important to both push back and say, we know we need to find the right technician for this problem. But then also saying, in the meantime, I'm going to choose to roll up my sleeves or not. And and that's a choice that you make for yourself, and that comes with its own burdens. Um, but it. It's, it's, it's a difficult issue. It's one that I, I'm very sensitive to um, because every museum right now, it's like, it's the question. It's, it's a huge question and it's a question that's been asked for decades, you know, and that's no mistake. Um, and so it's, it's really about, you know, making the choice for yourself first and foremost because it's, it's labor intensive work and it is someone's job. And maybe your job is finding, you know, the, the racial institute to bring in to do um, social justice training within your institution um, or maybe it is showing up and being on that committee because every museum got that committee and they meet and during lunch department. and you're like this is my lunch um, but yeah so it's it's an interesting thing that I think we're all a part of but I think being able to speak up in these spaces and, and especially to find community and say like okay so how does it work in your museum um, and what work are you doing and what questions have you asked and what vocabulary have you used to be able to create these particular types of changes um, I think that that's something that uh, we're, we're heading towards two, and, and it's definitely an iteration of something that's come before us, um, or even like you know mounting frustration as a text also to add to the homework book. Um, but to understand that protest and, and standing up for these kinds of issues is not something that's new in museums. Okay, w final question. Thank you. Um, so first of all, thank you, and I just wanna, I appreciate that you are open about um, and share that you're in a process of um, your process uh, in a process of um, evolving your understanding about uh, many things as you go and I recognize that that's um, not easy to do like in public um, so thank you and my question is uh, I'm curious what it is about social sculpture that is uh, feels like not a not right linguistic container for what you were doing with black guard incubator I was just curious why you um, felt that it yeah, rubbed the wrong way yeah. Well, first of all, I don't even know how to describe social sculpture. That's the first mistake I made. <laughs> but I was like, I love this language. Love like, word, it's yeah. so slippery. Like, everybody here says slippery, which I, like, miss about being in an, an academic institution. Like, slippery is such a, like, it's, like, the most commonly used word. Um, <laughs> but it's a very slippery discourse. And um, I felt like s we wanted to do something that was in kind of, like, some relationship to a social practice kind of work and, and social sculpture was the thing that I arrived to um, and then the group all confirmed but I feel like it, it was a mistake because we could have found better verbiage for it. It's just what stuck because we haven't found um, work for what we're doing which in many ways is like a lot of the success of it and I think people were like surprised, pleasantly surprised by the work we were doing because it hadn't really been done or not in recent memory. Um, but yeah, so I, I've been like, it's still, it's the language that we use so it stays um, but I am really interested in how, I mean, collective is much more productive. It's like we're collective enacting these acts. We're collective asking these questions. Um, that's not a sculpture. We're just four black women with opinions and uh, resources um, and staying power, hopefully. <laughs> well, Kimberly, thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Yeah. Can I? Just to add uh, th three things about homework and infrastructure and generosity. On homework, you can, uh, f you'll find uh, documentation of this video and many others on the Arts Design Berkeley website, including homework that includes an uh, interview uh, with Nadia Ellis and Jenna Wortham, the uh, uh, co-author of uh, uh, the forthcoming book we heard about, on infrastructure, uh, this isn't possible without an incredible in commitment of infrastructure and, and uh, labor from our student staff running around, from the BAM PFA staff, and in particular from A plus D staff, Lauren Pearson and Sarah Dragovich. Can you help me thank our living infrastructure? And I'll just ask you to continue what you already started on um, the finding the capacity for generosity today. Thank you for that generosity today. Thank you for uh, sharing it with us and thank you for committing uh, to this space today and making it a committed space. All right, thank you to Stephen Best as well.